Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my talk is going to be on intramental inter interventionism, uh, which is uh, or relates to the question, how or does God act in the world and how does God act in the world? Um, for this, I just start directly uh, into, the, into the problem that there are different kinds of, um, of divine action, even personal th th uh, theists can conceive. So some theists think God does not act in the world at all. Some, th some people think that God um, can break natural laws. That are the two extreme positions. But there are actually, actually a lot of positions in between. In order to form a good theory of divine action, it's important to see what options are out there. What are the extremes and how can we maybe create an intermediate position on divine action? Um, just to maybe say sort these into three groups, I have this uh, um, um, uh, the, the structure, this typology between non-interventionism, weak interventionism, and strong interventionism. A strong interventionist theory assumes that God can break natural laws whenever he wants to. He can make people walk onto water. He can resurrect people from the dead. He could even change the natural laws from today to tomorrow. In that case, you don't have to break them. He just changes them. Um, of course, such a theory has huge problems. And I think the biggest problem of such a theory um, is the problem of theodicy. So if we assume that God could break or change the natural laws whenever, however he wants to, um, we the, the question that is already there, why, God, why does God not intervene? How, why does he not um, uh, minimize the amount of evil in the, in the world? Um, uh, strong interventionism makes that problem even um, more radical. Um, that's also why Klaus von Storch calls for a theory of divine action, which is theodice sensible in Deutsch, so, yeah, as a sensitive uh, to theodicy. Of course, we can um, put certain restriction on a strong interventionist theory. So if we assume that God is at least minimally uh, a moral agent, uh, it's say he does not inflict unnecessary harm uh, by his interventions. Uh, but that's really just a, a minimal restriction. Um, a restriction that is uh, put onto divine intervention by many theists is that God Either he cannot or he decides not to undermine human autonomy. Usually, and especially for open theists, that's actually a logical, a logical um, impossibility. God cannot create freedom and take it back whenever he wants to or sees it fit. So giving real freedom to creatures or even autonomy to creation as a whole um, implies certain, and Raphael mentions that, uh, mentioned that, uh, a self-restriction, a kenosis in God, which does not necessarily make all kinds of strong interventions uh, or breaking of natural laws impossible. That, of course, depend, depends on your theory, but um, it restricts divine action in many ways. So especially when it comes to moral evils, if a person freely decides to do an immoral action, God, by, by maintaining or, or accepting human autonomy, uh, he cannot just change the decision of the person uh, to harm another person. He can also not um, make uh, or limit the consequences, make the consequences not as bad. We sometimes hear the stories, uh, maybe some of you know of John Paul II, he, there was this um, uh, a shooting, uh, uh, attentat, what is that in English, uh, a person trying to kill him, and then uh, he didn't succeed, and then uh, John Paul II and other people thought that it was by the intervention of uh, uh, Mary, the mother of God, who kind of uh, changed the trace of the bullet a little bit, so, so that the, the, the bullet only harmed but not killed the Pope. Also, this, it is not a direct changing of a decision of a person, that uh, an evil decision a person makes, but still it undermines human autonomy by um, changing the consequences of one's action. If we really, really want to be uh, moral actions, we need um, to rely on the natural laws that what we intend to do 
is actually uh, is actualized um, as far as we can predict that by um, uh, knowing um, or extrapolating uh, using the using the natural laws. Another restriction which is um, um, put on the table by all kinds of free will theists, not only um, open theists, is that God needs to maintain his uh, or may, needs to maintain hidden in some way. If God were to show himself in a too obvious manner in creation, crea creatures would not have the free decision to accept or, uh, or reject God's existence. So it's important for human autonomy to be free to believe in God or not. But if God intervenes in a way in the world that the, the best explanation or the only rational explanation to say this miracle here um, um, is given to us by uh, the Almighty, then we're not free not to believe in God anymore. And that also undermines human autonomy. And even um, if it's true, what uh, open theists say that God created free will, not as an end to itself, but in order to enable a loving relationship between cre creatures and, uh, and God, then it's really important that uh, we can freely um, enter in this loving relationship with God. And um, open theism, that's actually, I think, a reason why German theologians are very skeptical of this school, because, I mean, they, uh, they are um, widespread, especially within uh, American ev evangelicalism. Um, a kind of moderate or liberal kind of evangelicalism compared to other evangelicals or even uh, Calvinists, determinists, divine command eth ethicists, and so on. Uh, but still, they in principle agree on a strong interventionism. That's, um, Raphael, what you said, what distinguishes John Sanders um, uh, from, uh, from Thomas Ord, who rejects a strong interventionism, that God eternally is not able to uh, create a world in which he um, can intervene at any time. And for open theists, all limitations on interven divine intervention, so it's principle, God could intervene any time, but he um, decides to limit um, his options for interventions uh, in order to maintain, to create, or to maintain um, human autonomy. Okay, so we got strong interventions, we got restrictions on strong interventionism, um, and thereby making it weaker and weaker and weaker. Um, but there's a new category of weak intervention, which I want to introduce, which is not only strong interventionism plus restrictions, but a different form. Weak interventionism, as I define it, accepts that God cannot create natural laws. There's this argument often uh, put forward by Thomists, which say God cannot create laws and then um, um, reject what he created as laws, because then God would widersprechen, uh, um, um, uh, what's that in English? Uh, he, could, he would um, deny himself in some way. So if we accept, uh, that argument or not, um, assume God cannot intervene or cannot create natural laws, which he created, which he wanted to, uh, uh, to be. Still, natural laws could be formed in a way that they have a certain openness to them, which enables divine intervention without breaking them. And actually, the natural laws, as far as we think, um, yeah, or what our best physical account of the natural laws are, is that there is a certain indeterminism in them. Um, of course, there are different interpretations of quantum mechanics. There are de also deterministic interpretations of quantum mechanics, such as Bohm Bohmian mechanics. So even physicists are really cannot agree here on an adequate interpretation. That's probably also because when we try to interpret interpret quantum mechanics, we become philosophers um, uh, because there is no clear border to draw between metaphysics and physics on the, on the quantum level, which makes things really difficult. However, 
most physicists and most philosophers interpreting uh, physics um, uh, would say there's good evidence that the indeterminism of the physical world is not only on an epistemological level, but also on an ontological level. And if we have ontological plus epistemological indeterminism, the only laws that we have are statistical laws. Oh, we know that, I mean, that's not, it relates to quantum mechanics, but it's, it's, it's something that is, um, that is more uh, accessible. It's actually ra radioactive decay. There is a statistical law. We know that half of the, um, um, isotopes will decay within a certain time, but there is no way physically to predict when this certain isotope will decay. So it's only a statistical law determining the statistics, but not the behavior of the individual um, or of the element of the isotope. And if that is true, uh, there could be a manipulation of statistics, which is only rare, which does not negate the natural laws, as long as in long term the statistics are, are still working, or maybe we need uh, manipulating the statistics here and then we manipulate it here, and then at the end um, um, uh, the statistical law still holds. Um, some physicists would say that's still a strong kind of interventionism because if the laws are based on randomness, then manipulating statistics rejects the randomness. So some physical stuff to discuss here, but we can agree that it's a more a weaker way of intervening in the world than breaking natural laws. It's, uh, it's action, divine action um, within the openness of the natural laws. Such weak interventionism gives only very few options for a macroscopical, uh, macroscopical intervention in the world. So walking on water is just um, there is no statistic that, uh, that we say um, uh, one time in a, in a million people could walk on water. Well, physicists would agree, would say there is a, a possibility of one to 10 to the 16th or something, um, but it's, uh, it's so low that a manipulation here would not be hidden anymore. It would be absolutely obvious. It's like if we throw a dice and we have a six um, on the dice, a hundred times in a row, then nobody would believe that's coincidence or statistics. Like every sane person would say, you manipulated this dice. So statistical manipulation, if that, that criterion of, of maintaining divine hiddenness is still active, then such a manip manipulation could, can only be cover, covert. So in a way that it's uh, indistinguishable from a statistical anom anomaly, that's important. And if that is true, then there are very few options where God could act um, uh, that it has macroscopical, uh, physically, empirically detectable consequences. There is, um, the, the problem is that the quantum world is indeterminate, but the physical world is more or less uh, determinate. And that is because of the physical principle of decoherence which says the more interactions, like every interactions, every measurement of a certain particle, a cardinal, destroys its quantum behavior and makes that object um, uh, um, behave like um, a particle, like a macroscopical, um, um, macroscopical particle. That's also the reason why Schrodinger's cat, everyone talks about Schrodinger's cat, but Schrodinger's cat cannot exist. It's not about a measurement or ob observation from the outside. Even within Schrodinger's cat, there are um, um, there are measurements going on all the time because every time a particle interacts with another particle, uh, it is a kind of a measurement and it breaks down um, uh, the quantum coherence, and that's the process of decoherence. So. We got a problem here, and that is that weak interventionism usually does not allow divine actions with any um, important consequences. Maybe there is an exception, and I will talk about that exceptions in a minute. First, we continue that list to non-interventionism, 
Um, that's the theory that there is no special divine action at all. God acts even in non-interventionism picture, but in a, in a way of creating the universe, maintaining the universe, and maybe in some way through natural laws or, uh, or through creatures, but in a very indirect way. How could we stand such an indirect way? Um, although I don't want to concentrate on this uh, issue in this talk, maybe just a couple sentences about that. Um, that's the idea of divine contingency plans, which um, uh, I think Raphael or, or was it um, uh, um, Josefa from the talk before mentioning this, uh, divine contingency plans is, the, is that the idea that God does not successively act and react in creation, but he builds his interventions into the natural laws from the beginning. So the idea of fine-tuning natural laws, which we know from the teleological argument for the existence of God, so maybe God fine-tuned uh, the natural laws so that it's very likely that at some point in the universe, intelligent life will exist. So that idea could be, um, uh, could be further developed to say he even fine-tunes the natural laws so that certain exceptions are built into these laws. And these exceptions um, uh, can be uh, conceived as reactions to, um, uh, to certain events that happen in the world. So from our perspective, it's a reaction, something happens, God reacts to this, but this reaction is from the beginning built into the natural laws because God, even in open theist picture, he doesn't know what will come, he no but he knows all the possible histories. When he creates the world, God knows the set of all possible histories and all possible creatures that could exist and what they will do without middle knowledge. So not what, what they would do in certain situations, just um, what they could do in certain situations. And he could um, plan ahead uh, for every uh, possibility. And open thieves use this, um, this idea a lot uh, when they're confronted with the uh, objection that uh, the God of open theism is way too risky and God uh, uh, is overwhelmed and cannot know ahead what will come and is surprised and he cannot guarantee that the uh, that creature will come to a good end at the end. So uh, divine contingency plans can be used to combine interventionism, non-interventionism in some way. So God does not have to um, 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 break natural laws, but the natural, the real natural laws, you could say the metaphysical natural laws, are not the same as what we believe that natural laws are. Because our accounts of natural laws are um, simplified versions without these exceptions. But here we already see the limit of this theory. Um, because divi even divine contingency plans only allows very rare intervention because the metaphysical natural laws and the real natural laws, they cannot be too different because if they were too different, it would not be uh, possible that we in our limited human co cognition could conceive the simplified versions of natural laws. And that's at the end would also undermine our autonomy because we need more or less simple, predictable behavior of the world so that we can form intentions. Um, there is a, is a metaphor of this, uh, this model, which I found more and more in, in uh, Christian dogmatics, especially in pneumatology. The idea that God's not directly intervening in the world, but um, the world is filled with grace or filled with God's spirit from the beginning. It's no pure nature. It's always um, uh, nature filled with grace. And um, God's spirit is working within the world, slowly transforming the world. And I, I love this metaphor, but I always ask, yeah, well, how does it do that? How does the spirit work in the world? So it only shifts the problem. But maybe uh, this idea of God's spirit is a certain metaphor um, for a theory of divine contingency. Um, so we see even divine contingency plans, even this model has strong restrictions due to autonomy, divine hiddenness, um, and um, yeah, these restrictions maintain. Now I wanna talk a little more on weak interventions. 
which of course is, as I see, combinable with divine contingency plans. So if you don't want to be open theist, if you don't want to have a temporal God, all that I say about strong or weak interventionism could be transformed in divine contingency way, which makes it more, uh, more difficult, which I say just apply uh, Occam's razor and uh, the personal God who is really mutable is probably the easier solution, but I would not hold that it's the only possible solution. The idea of weak interventionism is that God intervenes in our mind and not in our mind, which exists somewhere in the spiritual world, but in our brains, in our mind through our brains. Sounds a little um, uh, uh, speculative, but uh, let me um, explain this theory. Um, I think that is, it's not only speculative, it's actually rooted in a lot of religious experience people make. Because personal experience of divine action is usually for most believers, not God made that miracle work of it, or let me walk on water. But the experience of divine actions, God enabled me, gave me the strength to do, to, uh, to give, to do a good deed, or God helped me in prayer with an important decision. God spoke to me through my conscience, or I feel God's love in my heart. All these are personal experiences of divine action. And of course, we could explain them away, and that sub a subjective feeling has nothing to do with God's reality, or it's only a, a symbol. God is actually, God loves everyone all the time, eternally. And if we feel that it's true, but it's not a real communication of God, we only think that it is. But a lot of people, uh, talk about or, or live in their sp uh, spiritual life a real personal relationship with God. Even in petitioning or prayer, there's that, I think there was a, is a big change in the past decades of petitioner prayers, uh, um, at least in, in a Catholic context, where um, before sometimes was God, please make peace in the world or something. It's more um, good in the individual. Lord, give us the strength to help build peace on earth. A lot of people think that this way of doing petitionary prayer is more adequate, but it shifts the problem from strong to weak interventionism. So if that's not only placebo, if it's not actually our belief that gives us the strength independent of God exists or not, um, it requires the idea that God in some way really gives me the strength. I would not have that strength if God did not intervene in the world. Also in Christology, I think that model is quite adequate um, because on a Chalcedonian model, God became man, but empirically indistinguishable from ordinary human beings. He was not a superman or something or a person with, with omniscience. He just had a regular human brain with limited uh, cognition and other limitations. But, and that uh, what was constitutes his, his uh, divinity is that he has a unique relationship to God in his consciousness. So that what makes, makes Christ special is that there's something different in his consciousness. Uh, he reached a certain way of, of thinking, of having a relationship with God that as Christians believe no other uh, human person ever had in human history. And also this uh, makes us ask the question, how does that special relationship, how was that formed? Is that something that the creation could bring about by itself? Or it has disposition from the beginning to form such a God consciousness? Or is it based on a certain intervention of God? How does God intervene in human minds? There is a great model um, in a different context. It's about um, uh, consciousness and whether consciousness, um, or it's a discussion of functionalism, whether consciousness, the, the brain works as a computer. And uh, Roger Penrose, a uh, famous physicist, I think he got the Nobel Prize of Physics last year, and uh, uh, biologist Stuart Hammerov. They proposed a model of the human brain saying that the human brain more or less works like a quantum computer because it has a very special structure that breaks down decoherence. So there are certain mechanisms within the brain which work, they say, as quantum amplifiers. 
that make certain indeterminism of the quantum level have macroscopic uh, consequences, which I said before, which usually in normal nature very, very rarely happens. But maybe if that's true, if the human brain is a quantum computer, then in here, breaking down of decoherence is happening all the time. And that is why human consciousness is not reducible to an algorithm. That's why consciousness cannot be described or emulated on a Turing machine. This way natural decoherence avoid and it combines this idea of God intervening in creation in the openness of the natural laws and God communicating or uh, intervening in the world by communicating with human minds. So we do not need a dualist theory of of, of mind and brain in order to make God connect with the human mind, it's possible uh, mediated through nature. So we could apply this model to uh, the, the, the Penrose Hammerov model to defend dualism. Um, certain mechanisms in the brain could connect the immaterial soul and immaterial body. It's possible. Um, but discussed and rejected by Penrose and also not the way I want to go here in this talk. But I uh, propose that this model could be applied for intramental divine intervention. That is, God could slightly change the way persons think or act by changing statistical processes on a quantum level within the human brain. That's not discussed by Penrose. Um, it's, an, it's a theological application of his model. And that can be defended with an open theism, uh, open theist framework. So here, um, um, as I said, God knows all possible futures and God knows ahead all possible occasions where intramental interventionism could occur. And then he decides successively when the situation arises, when and where to intervene and um, whether it is adequate um, um, if it's sufficiently maintaining um, or having these restrictions we talked about before, um, are these restrictions uh, given? Are there actually natural occasions where this instrumental intervention is possible? And then get, God can decide whether to intervene here or not. Or we could defend a contingency plans version of this, that God uh, eternally builds a respective mechanism into creation, which primarily affects human brains the spirit working in nature, which um, usually um, affects uh, creatures, maybe also animals, not only human brains, uh, but at least um, um, places in the universe where consciousness uh, appears. There are certain restrictions to this model um, that we already, or that I already mentioned uh, regarding weak interventionism, but um, to make that more clear or to repeat that. So from an open theist or free, free will theism perspective, God, of course, must restrict himself only to intervene in a way that maintains human autonomy, which means we have to give God in a certain way permission to act through us, to change the way of our thinking. Otherwise, that would undermine our autonomy. And that's why a really adequate prayer uh, is often thought is, God, give me the strength to, or God, or just God, thy will be done, Jesus said um, um, in Gethsemane. So he, he also, he, he, he loses his strength of will. You see that in the Gethsemane story. And he prays to God, uh, and it even says that an angel strengthened him, strengthened Jesus, uh, answering to his prayer, uh, the prayer uh, is not, please free, free me from this, well, he also, if, if it's possible for you, that let this uh, chalice be go go, um, um, go away from me. Uh, but at the end, it's thy will be done. And already by saying that, we give God permission to act through us. God restricts himself to intervene, intervene rarely, such that humans can sufficiently predict the outcome of their decisions and bear sufficient responsibility towards the well-being of each other. That's more or less Swinburne's argument and extension of free will uh, defense on uh, also natural laws. That, of course, applies to this model, too. Um, God restricts um, 
And so that here, it's important that God only intervenes when he knows that we do not have the power to do that alone. Now, it could be an incremental intervention if God helps me to pass the test, uh, an exam that I write. But if I was too lazy yesterday to study for the test, then this intervention would undermine our um, moral responsibility um, to study ourselves for the test. But if we studied as hard as we could, if we, if we did everything we could, and then praying that God does the rest for us or helps us with the rest a little bit, that would not undermine our autonomy. God restricts himself only to intervene in a way such um, that he, that was the divine uh, uh, hiddenness, so that he stays sufficiently hidden, uh, hidden, enabling a free rational decision, even for atheism. So these restrictions also, or even more, apply to the intramental interventionist model. The benefits to open theism, um, in my opinion, are, is that we do not need strong interventionism. Most open theists advance a strong form of interventionism, only restricted by God, not undermining human autonomy. And this way, I think the theodicy problem cannot be adequately solved. That is why process theists or almost process theists like Oward um, uh, reject the standard open theist model. Which they say, well, God could have, he could maintain human autonomy, but he could change and create just some natural laws that are not, bring not about that many natural evils. So many people even think that standard open theism intensifies the theodicy problem because it accepts an, an, a, a strong interventionism. So, and here I go not all the way with Ord, but more Ord than, uh, than other open theists. I think there must be a restriction within creation, which Ord and others title sometimes the autonomy of the cosmos. I do not like that because autonomy is usually something we, uh, an attribute we apply to, to, to um, individuals, to uh, uh, in, in individual persons. Uh, but a certain analog way of autonomy, uh, one that does enable some kind of divine intervention. So we could think that he creates an absolute autonomous um, um, world, but then he can, is only an observer. He cannot do anything, that's theism. We could say he, he creates um, a non-autonomous creation. That is one he could intervene all the time. The question is, can such a creation um, bring about creaturely autonomy in the long term? Probably not. Or we have a certain intermediate way, which says he creates an autonomous creation, but one that has a certain openness that enables some kind of divine intervention, possibly only instrumental uh, intervention because that's the most important thing for God to connect with human beings, maybe even the purpose of creating um, the universe as a whole. Weak interventionism with intramental divine, uh, uh, <laughs> intramental divine actions explain why God only intervenes on an interpersonal level, only rarely and in a hidden way. Open theism can even benefit from a theory of contingency plans regarding God's instrumental intervention for the purpose of minimizing creational risks. That's, I think, are the benefits to open theism of this model. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And I'm um, yeah, really interested to hear what you think.